Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kuntra Zink. I'm a program manager in the SQL Server performance team. Um, and we'll be talking about running SQL Server over SMB today. So traditionally, SQL Server runs e either on direct attached disk in typically smaller setups or you know, traditional SANs, um, disk arrays, fiber channel infrastructure, et cetera, in the higher end uh, of our customer uh, environments. Now, there's a, a, a new option, SMB file shares. Um, it has uh, quite a few advantages in terms of manageability, usability, and, and just the effort of uh, you know, bringing new stuff online, running your SQL Server environment in general. Um, typically, at least <clears throat> with uh, Windows Server 2012 and, and later, um, shares can be highly available, high, very fast. Um, it takes some complexity out of the solution if you don't have to zone your LUNs for the SQL servers and, and all that, especially when you run SQL Server and HA and you have failover clustering, etc. cetera. Um, your file server can leverage commodity components, whether your file server is using direct attached drives or a SAN or a mix of both. Um, the complexity is hidden from SQL. You just set up your file server whichever way you want. And it's, uh, it reduces operational costs, really, in terms of managing the whole environment, uh, change management. Let's say you want to upgrade your SQL server. It's much, much easier. And we, we go into details a little later, what happens, for example, when you upgrade your SQL server to a bigger machine. Um, now, SQL Server is a little different than your typical file server workload. Typical apps that use file servers as data store are, for example, your office products, et cetera. And they tend to um, overwrite, you know, write new copies of Word documents. They don't tend to overwrite in place. They tend to write new versions of things, right? And most, <clears throat> most often, the I.O. performance or the I.O per second uh, requirements are a little lower. SQL tends to be a little heavy on the, on the I.O. side in terms of you know, requirements. Um, again, SQL Server, <clears throat> high IOPS volume. SQL Server tends to overwrite in place. So you have a couple of terabyte data file, and we're going to overwrite an 8K page somewhere in the middle there. Very unusual um, for file servers to have that kind of workload. And typically, we have hotspots in the data files. So not all data is accessed equally. There's usually a moving hotspot. Now, now why would I run SQL Server on an SMB share? Um, where in the past, SMB shares haven't exactly been known to be very performant. Network reliability back in the 100 megabit days were so-so. Um, and just typically, you know, SANs were much more reliable than your average file server back in the day. Um, it has changed, though, with the advent of gigabit Ethernet being standard. And you can already buy servers that have 10 gigabit on board as an option, right? Um, networking has become much faster and uh, also much more reliable to a point where, you know, Ethernet is comparable to fiber channel in terms of bandwidth. Um, in some cases, uh, and it's definitely cheaper than fiber channel. Um, manageability is a lot simpler. Um, you don't have to zone, you know, create a bunch of LUNs and zone them to the switch and zone the switch to the worldwide names of the HBAs and the HBA breaks. You have to redo the zoning and all. All that complexity is gone. When you use a file server, you just connect to the share, make sure that your service account has permissions on the file share, and that's about it. Um, moving things around from one file server to the other. Um, you know, all those things are implemented on the file server layer. And SQL Server just connects to a share, and all the complexity behind it is gone. And, and another problem is quite typically organizationally, especially in large, uh, larger uh, IT environments, you have the SAN group that do the LUNs and they zone the switches. And you have the sysadmins. They install OSs and they, if you're lucky, install SQL Server. And then there is the 
third one, which are the database administrators that run SQL Server. DBAs talk to the admins, but DBAs never talk to the SAN guys. And the administrators in the middle don't know what SQL is and don't know much about storage. So I've seen many problems, many projects fail or take much longer than they should have because rarely do those three groups meet. There's usually one in the middle that talks to both sides and doesn't know what each other's talking about. So we can take the SAN guys really out of the mix here and uh, run everything on file shares. You, you take some of the organizational complexity out. You don't actually have to talk to the SAN guys if you want to migrate your SQL server to another machine, right? And it's typically lower cost. Um, with Windows Server 2012 and later, you can create highly available, a highly available solution on commodity hardware, and, and that drops the cost quite a bit compared to traditional enterprise SANs. SMB Direct. RDMA stands, uh, stands for uh, Remote Direct Memory Access. Um, basically copying data to the other guy's memory straight up with, without having to do the usual TCP IP packet in a packet in a packet in a packet and each of them with his own checksum and all that. It's just a extremely high speed, very low CPU overhead and very low latency way of transferring data between machines. Now, SMB has been, uh, RDMA has been out there for a while, but it was historically only used by HPC, InfiniBand, used in high performance computing clusters, right? Uh, now with Server 2012, RDMA is uh, natively fully supported in Windows, uh, meaning it's, in the past, HPC has been kind of interesting. You had to install those tools, those third party tools, just to get your things to talk to each other. Now it's fully integrated in Windows, and Windows sees that the device is RDMA capable. On both sides, it'll just automatically switch to RDMA. What's the required hardware? Of course, you need an RDMA capable you know, network interface, whether that's an InfiniBand card or a Ethernet card that supports Rocky or iWarp. Um, In-house, we did most of our testing with InfiniBand just because of the availability. Um, 32 and 56 gigabit, that's QDR and FDR and Finiband. It also fully integrates in multi-channel, meaning you have, let's say, two dual port cards in each server. Uh, you can actually transfer data on all four links simultaneously. So, when I updated that table a few days ago, uh, looking at what's the, the cost with regards to my bandwidth, right? So you used to end run of, oops, sorry, wrong button. Um, one gigabit Ethernet is default. Every server that you bought in the last three or four years has at least one of these. Most of them have two or four one gig ports. So the NIC port is free, let's say. All right. Switch ports, you know, about 10 bucks a port. You, you buy a 64 port switch or so, you know, they're, they're about five, six grand. So um, total price, Per port is 10 bucks. You can do 110 megabytes per second. That puts your cost at, at about 10 cents per megabyte per second. Right. So it's very cheap, but you're limited to 100 megabytes a second. 10 gig Ethernet, which is you know becoming the standard. Um, if you if you have to buy a NIC, a dual port NIC is usually around 600 dollars. So I put the cost at 300 dollars per port. At a switch port, if you look at what the 48 or 64 port switches go, go for, it breaks down to about $400 per 10 gig port. So we're looking at $700 per port adding switch and NIC. You can transfer about 1,100 megabytes per second. That puts the cost at 63 cents per megabyte per second of usable bandwidth. Now, 56 gigabit InfiniBand, also called FDR, full data rate InfiniBand. Um, Dual port card runs about $1,600, so it's $790 per port if you do uh, using latest list pricing. Switch port is $243. Again, I just looked, on, looked up, you know, 36 port Mellanox switch on the web. That's what they go for. So we're looking at about $1,000 per port, adding NIC and switch port. Now, the, meg the bandwidth you, you get on one of these is 5,600 megabytes per second on a single port, single link. That puts the cost at 18 cents per megabyte per second. 
And for reference, on the bottom, you see 16 gig in uh, fiber channel. Um, it's still rather pricey because the cards are, you know. I found more, more HBA than switches. I only found switches from one vendor so far. So it, it's emerging technology, eight, you know, 16 gig. Um, again, what I found in terms of pricing, $1,400 per port for the NIC. The switch port, 861 Puts the total at 1,883. Uh, the bandwidth you can get on a 16 gig fiber channel is about 1,500 megabytes per second. That puts the cost at $1.51 per megabyte per second. So if you look at this, at, at the cost breakdown, aside from one gig ethernet, which is really limited in terms of, for, for SQL Server, a single one gig port is not really, typically is not enough to drive SQL Server, right? Let's say you need a little more bandwidth in that, then it's clear that uh, InfiniBand, in terms of uh, in terms of price performance, is very compelling. So this is a, a list of steps. What happens when I want to move my SQL Server to a new machine? Let's say my five-year-old server needs to be replaced with a new one. In the on, on the left side, what happens when the database is hosted on a typical enterprise SAN? First, we have to take the database offline. Then we have to, you know, talk to the SAN guys to remap the LUNs to the new server. Get the worldwide names of the HBAs and get all the zones done and all that. And if we have some multi-pass solution implemented, that gets a little more complex even, right? Or a switch in the middle. Um, then we unmap the LUNs, map them to the new server. Then the sysadmins come in. The server sees the new LUNs and then have to go out and put drive letters on it. And, Again, might have to configure multipath IO again on a server, etc. Finally, um, you know, all the drive letters are where they need to be, and we can go and attach the database to SQL Server again. At that point, it's online. That's quite a few things that need to take place while the database is offline. If you have it on a file share, all you have to do is go, make sure that the permissions are there, that the file share and the file and the file permissions on the share are correct for for the account that SQL Server runs in. You can do that while SQL is still running. Then you detach it on the old database server, attach it on the new one, done. That's, that's all they have to do to move your SQL server from one server to the other. So the amount of, the number of things you have to do while the database is down is basically zero, meaning you have a lot less downtime when you have to do that. You don't have to involve sysadmins. You don't have to involve uh, the SAN guys, none of that. So wh why is this a new thing with SMB? So prior to SQL Server 2008 R2, it was actually not supported to have your database or log files on a file share. Um, with, with 2008 R2, um, it was supported to have user databases as opposed to system databases. So back then, you couldn't have TempDB, Master, MSDB, or any of those on a share. You can have user databases on a share. Um, you could do it before R2, but it required a trace flag and was not supported. So in 2008 R2, it was supported, limited to user databases. And we started adding SMB scenarios to our automated tests for, for basically every nightly build gets run through the ringer here. Um, and in SQL Server 2012, um, I'd say we added full support for SMB. So there's no limitations. You can actually have your system databases um, on a, on a share, you can install SQL Server, the program files directly itself on a share. Um, we support the various ways you can cluster things, um, we, whether we use CSVs, whether we use file shares that are on CSVs, etc. Um, and uh, we mount, we can go straight to UNC path names, so you, you don't have the drive letter limitations. What if I need a 29th volume and all that, right? Um, so SQL Server is using UNC path names for everything. And of course, as soon as we started running SQL over SMB, we found a few things here and there that have, haven't been discovered up to that point. Uh, we found a very severe serialization in Windows where on read heavy work, when you had a read write workloads, the writes got blocked 
depending on the read queue depth, etc. So there is a fix that went into 2012. I think some of it was spec ported to 2008 R2 as well. That significantly increased uh, performance. Uh, on it was actually on the SMB client side where we found that serialization. So the next couple of slides are about how SQL does I/O. Sometimes I hear the saying, guys, oh, can't you just run a little higher, you know, increase your queue depth, or can you reduce your queue depth? Uh, no, we can't really. Um, this explains how SQL does I.O. OLTP, online transaction processing. Think of the back end of an Amazon.com or your, your online ordering entry system, your, your warehouse management, things like that, right? Um, the read I.O. on the data drives is synchronous, so it means we wait for them. Let's say you want to update the zip code of your zip code. You're a customer, you want to update your zip code. We have to go out, and if the page, database page that, that contains your zip code is not in memory, we have to all go out to disk and get it. The way we do that is we post the I.O., say, okay, read that page into memory, and then that thread goes to sleep. When the I.O. has been done by either the local you know, a SCSI controller, fiber channel card, or via SMB. Uh, when the I.O. is complete, the thread gets set back to runnable, and at that point, we can go in and, you know, change that zip code. So that read request to get that page in is synchronous. We're waiting for it. The thread is blocked until that page is in memory. The writes are asynchronous. So let's say you update your zip code. That change, the, that page has changed in memory, and we log the change to our log file. But eventually, we want to update the on-disk copy of that page that holds your zip code. And that's done asynchronously. So we, we're not blocking everything, anything on that. Um, there's two ways this happens. Typically, it's a checkpoint. So you, you specify a checkpoint, or you say, back up this. And what happens is SQL will start a checkpoint in the background. A checkpoint is we go and find all the pages that have changed in memory and write them back to disk. And the other way that happens is uh, we have a thing called lazy writer, which is lazily in the background walk through and just writes change pages back out to disk. Again, it's asynchronous. They tend to be somewhat bursty, so it's not a real steady flow of writes. It's a little there's there's usually some burstiness to it, um, and uh, especially when you have a big write cache somewhere along the lines, typically those very large disk arrays with tens or hundreds of gigabytes of cache, you'll see that this a checkpoint where we write those pages out that goes very quickly. Tens of thousands of writes, but then the write cache is full and the write cache needs to destage. And that's typically when the problems start. Our log drive is basically where we log transactions as they happen in the, in the right order. Let's say you deposit $10,000 in your account and then you, you take 10000 out again. You want to make sure that this happens in the right order. And when we have a crash, what we do is we read that log and apply the same transactions in the same order. Let's say SQL crashed or we lost power um, between the time when you, let's say, you changed your zip code and the time we, when you change your zip code, we log the change in the log file. But the page in memory might not have been written back to disk. So on the next SQL startup, um, we have to go to the log file and find any transactions that haven't been applied yet, the disk, right? And um, so in these things, it's critical that we, the data is not lost. So we can, we can lose data here. If, if we have, a, you know, if we, we lose some data, let's say the last minute or so of I.O. of writes to this drive is lost, we can survive because we can reconstruct it from this one. But if we lose data here, we're toast. Data is, that's, that's when we have real data loss. So the log file, again, we write to it sequentially. So everything you change, let's say you change the zip code, we log that transaction. We log which page and what has changed. The sequential and they're small. The size of the write is typically the amount of data you change. You change the zip code, it's just a few bytes. We, I, I hear sometimes, you know, some of the same folks, oh, can't you do larger writes? You get more bandwidth? No, we really can't because we, we have to log this transaction by itself. 
because the other thing we use the log for is to undo things. For example, you're on Amazon, you put stuff in your shopping cart, and then you log off. Eventually, the thing times out, and we take things back out of their shopping cart. And quite often, we use a log drive for that. So we, we roll the transactions back, right? Uh, the log drive gets written to, written to, written to, and eventually, we call it truncate. So you do a, let's say you do a backup. You backup all the data in your log, and then we truncate it, meaning we mark that area that has been backed up as free, and we override it again on the next time around. So otherwise, your log file would be you know, constantly growing. So the only way <clears throat> you stop that from happening is by backing it up. From a performance point of view, um, latency is key. So when you change your zip code and you hit submit, you have to wait till the log file is actually written. And we do unbuffered IOs here. So that transaction will, is complete at the time the data is durable, not before that. Um, the size is driven by the workload. Again, you change your zip code. No, we can't make two megabyte writes out of you changing your zip code. Um, another interesting piece here is the native sector size. So our log writes are atomic, meaning our smallest writes that we do is the native sector size. And if you're on a 4K drive and you change only your zip code, we're going to have to pad those few bytes all the way with zeros, the whole 4K, because that whole write has to be atomic. It either happened, all of it or none of it happened. The other predominant SQL Server workload is data warehousing. So you have a data warehouse with all your sales records from the last 10 years. Some executive wants to know how the red bicycles have sold in Washington State in the last three years. So you go through all the sales records and find that information. Quite often, you have to go after information where we don't have an index for. Like we might have an index on zip codes, but we most likely don't have an index on the colors of the bicycles, right? So we have to go through all sales records and just add the ones up for the blue bicycles. So we have to scan all the data we have. That might be terabytes, tens of terabytes, and lately it can go 100 terabytes. We do that at by doing very large sequential reads. So we do 512K is the common size. There's ways to increase it, but 512K is what you typically see. Um, we post a lot of I.O. so we can, we can queue up to 34 megabytes of outstanding I.O. per processor, or per core, I should say. Um, the latency doesn't really matter, because we have to read those 10 terabytes. Whether each individual I.O. takes one millisecond or 100 doesn't matter. What matters is the time it takes to read the whole turbine. Um, the tricky part when you're on SANS, especially when they're thin provisioned or pooled or whatever you call it, um, we do sequential I.O. What happens when you place, oh, let's say, five files on the same physical spindle? By the time the I.O. hits the spindle, it's not sequential anymore. Right? You have like five individual sequential streams that or put on the same spindle, and you, you just lost oh, 80% of your performance by uh, transferring or by converting sequential, multiple sequential I.O. streams into one random stream. So the tricky part here has been in the past to lay out your LUNs so that you can guarantee that one spindle only holds data for one LUN. If one spindle you know, holds data for multiple LUNs, then you can't guarantee that sequential access stays sequential. And bandwidth. Bandwidth is key here. Um, make, so that the latest processors, the ones that are going to come out in September, the Ivy Bridge processors, we have a two-processor test system over in Building 35 where we read 31 gigabytes per second on a two-processor system. So whatever bandwidth there is, we can use it with SQL. There's no such thing as too much I.O. bandwidth. I haven't, and we're feeding that beast with uh, eight QDR and Finiband four file servers. So bandwidth is key for this kind of workload. Again, this is where Ethernet is really the wrong thing, and we need, we need InfiniBand. We need multiple InfiniBand links. I got through the whole thing a little quicker than I thought. Um, any questions?
questions? Well, thank you, Gunter, for presenting today. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, we'll go ahead and take a break.